Hey, Jim. Now I'm unmuted, I think. Yeah. Very good. I see, I see Dan is here. Great. Yes, Hello. I'm here. Great. Hello, Dan. Nice, nice to, to see you, Dan. Let's do video. And there we go. Great. Oh, I man. guess I need to do that too. There we go. All right. Great, Dan, thank you so much for this. Um, oh. okay, is it okay to call you Dan? Dr. Oh, yeah, Gifford? absolutely, yeah. And, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll work a Dr. Gifford in the introduction, but uh, <laughs> in with Ted and Dan. No, Dan, for sure. Great, very good. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, loved the book. It was uh, kind of a surprise. The start of last year, I saw it and it looked interesting enough. I figured, well, it has something to do with Chicago maritime history. I have to get it. And it was really <laughs> a surprise that the uh, your museum background aspect of looking at things really uh, made it an enjoyable book for me. Oh, good. Everybody know that we are recording tonight's program. So it's up to you if you want to have your video on or not. But uh, so just be forewarned. And uh, also when the program starts, please make sure you keep your microphones muted. Uh, I will mute, just FYI, I, just before we start, I will mute everybody. And after that, you have to unmute if you want to okay. talk. <clears throat> All right. So I've got right at seven o'clock now. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to mute everybody, Jim, and then you can okay. just unmute. Okay. All right. I think I'm back unmuted. So it's been a long year without having all our regulars at the museum. We sure miss you guys and look forward to being able to meet with you again soon. Hopefully by early summer, we will be reopening at the museum for regular visitors. Probably be a little bit longer before we could have group gatherings there, but sure looking forward to having people back visiting us at the museum. It's been a long time without that, but uh, the time has been well spent working on some new exhibits that will be in the work soon and uh, a few other nice new items added uh, on Sunday. Watch the newspaper. I think the Sun-Times is going to have an article on a large mural that we've just installed. And we got some other nice new artifacts being added to the collection. So along with all the tough times, some good things are going on at the museum. Um, one of those good things is these programs. We're really glad that we're able to start connecting with a lot of our old friends and a lot of new faces and being able to reach out to speakers from a little farther away. In fact, uh, last year, I wrote this book about this whaling ship and I thought, this is really good, but the guy's six hours away. How can I get him to drive 12 hours round trip to come give us a 45 minute talk? And so it's working out great that he's can be here with us tonight for this. Um, first, before we get into tonight's program though, I want to let you know that next month's Third Friday program is going to be a very well-known Great Lakes historian. His name is Fred Stonehouse. He's written 30 books on Great Lakes maritime history. And he was also a longtime president of the uh, U.S. Life Saving Service Heritage Foundation. And he's going to be speaking to us on the history of the Great Lakes Life Saving Service here in the Great Lakes. So hopefully a lot of you will come back and join us for that. Um, tonight, we're doing something a little different with our program. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Theodore Karamansky with us to lead a discussion with our guest. Uh, most of you know Ted Karamansky. He's written many books um, since I'll keep this short with him. Uh, just know that for those of you really into maritime history, his book Schooner Passage and his most recent uh, book, I wish I just blanked on the name. <laughs> Sorry, Ted. <laughs> Um, but uh, there are great books if, if you're into uh, maritime history. His books are absolute must reads. I got his book just out of arm's reach, so I can't grab it here. But uh, so he's a longtime professor at uh, Loyola, and he's the founder and director of their uh, public public history program. Um, he's a mentor, a role model, and good friend to us all. So we're really glad to have him here with us and also as a regular with the museum. So thanks a lot for joining us tonight, Ted. And our, our main guest speaker, 
like I was saying, I read his book and it, it wasn't just the story of this uh, ship that came to Chicago. It's his background as a museum specialist that gave him a really unique perspective on this story and made the story, I mean, a lot more aspects of it really opened up and made it much more interesting to us as a maritime museum, as well as Great Lakes maritime enthusiasts. So tonight, Dr. Daniel Gifford is gonna join us. He's a public historian who focuses on American popular and visual culture, as well as museums in American culture. He received his PhD from George Williams, oh, I'm sorry, George Mason University, I apologize. And his career spans both academia and public history including a few years with the Smithsonian Institution. That's almost as impressive as working at the Chicago Maritime Museum. But today he teaches at several universities all around the Louisville area. So please welcome Dr. Daniel Gifford. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for inviting me and having me. And, and yes, uh, I'm, I probably would have made the drive, truth be told, but this is actually a little more convenient. <laughs> um, so, I'm really glad that uh, we were able to do this Zoom program. Uh, before Ted and I begin our conversation, what I thought I'd do is actually maybe just go ahead and read uh, the first couple pages from the book, give you a sense of, of the book and sort of you know the setup, the, the basic structure, what we're gonna be talking about. So I'm gonna do a quick share screen. Um, While you're doing that, I wanna remind everybody, please mute your microphones. Uh, most everybody is. There's a few unmuted microphones, though, and we just wanted to make sure we keep any extraneous noise from interfering once we get started. I will mute myself right now. All right. So, oh, I'm sorry. One other thing. Uh, once we get going, on the very top right hand corner of your screen, there's a little thing that says view. If you choose speaker view, um, uh, See, that will be not when he's screen sharing, but uh, at other times, that way whoever's speaking will be the main part of your screen. So uh, when he's not, when the screen's not being shared, click on that view and choose speaker view. Great. All right, thank you, Jim. Thank you. All right, so so like I said, I'm just gonna go ahead and read the, uh, the first couple pages and then uh, Ted and I can you know, have a conversation about uh, what these, these pages set up. So, we're gonna start with New Bedford, June 8th, 1892. It seemed as if the entire harbor had spontaneously erupted into a palette of red, white, and blue. The colors gleamed in the bright sunlight and the, a stiff southeastern breeze tugged at the streamers and bunting that were generously affixed to nearly any object or edifice the decorators could find. The summer gusts also played with countless hats, jackets, dresses, and ribbons, among the tightly packed crowds who had congregated along the wharfs by mid-morning. A few stalwart boys who sat at Waters' Edge minded their fishing poles rather than the estimated 3,000 onlookers packed behind them. But they too could not keep their eyes off the gleaming hulk of red and white that sat just off to their right. The whaling bark progress had been festooned with bunting and streamers which snapped in the wind from the mastheads and yard arms. A large signal flag waved from the main mast, declared in bright tall letters the name of the bark, although she needed no introduction for those who had gathered. The crack of American flags echoed off the facade of the New Bedford Portage Company, before which the progress lay in wait. Her hull had been painted a bright brick red. Her divots built holding the six-man whaleboats gleamed white, as did the deckhouse. James E. Reed, the prominent African-American photographer who had co-founded Headley and Reed on Purchase Street, ensured that the proceedings were photographed to his exacting specifications and with his famous eye for detail. As the progress was towed away from Roach's Wharf, the crowd erupted in a deafening cheer which gave way to song. After a turn of life on the ocean wave, Hill's brass band led the New Bedford throngs the melancholy words of the girl I left behind me. Harbor traffic also bedecked in the decorative finery of signal flags and bright colors added to the cacophony. Bells and whistles accompanied the multitude's rendition of the well-known tune. Ye gods above, oh hear my prayer to my beauteous fair to find me 
and send me safely back again to the girl I left behind me. Ladies pulled out handkerchiefs to wave as the bark pulled towards Buzzard Bay. By that blustery day in June 1892, New Bedford had been launching whaling ships to every part of the globe for a century. Thousands of voyages had begun from the same wharfs that the Progress now passed on her way down to the bay. Central Wharf, Tabor Wharf, Atlantic Wharf. Tens of thousands of men had unmoored from New Bedford's docks, knowing the passage of time that marked distance from loved ones would be typically measured in years, not months or weeks. An incalculable number of new people in New Bedford had watched whalers disappear onto the horizon, wondering if they'd ever return. And yet, no single departure of a whaling ship had ever garnered or generated this sort of holiday atmosphere that surrounded the departure of this particular whaling ship. This departure was different, special. It carried with it the legacies, dreams, and memories of an entire community. The progress was not going to sea to hunt for whales, as so many whale ships had done before. She was going to Chicago to be displayed like a crown jewel for all the world to see. She was going to the World's Columbian Exposition of 1893, and New Bedfordiers were sure that she would be one of the most popular attractions at the World's Fair that promised to be the event of the decade, perhaps even century. She would tell American visitors from Maine to California a story about New Bedford's whaling heritage and history, and to remind the world how New Bedford had once lit the globe and lubricated the Industrial Revolution with whale oil. The cheers and huzzas and whistles gave voice to a civic pride that brought many New Bedfords to tears that day. The progress would mark their place in history. Now, Chicago, April 14th, 1900. Spring was slowly working its way into Chicago's frigid bones. The day had been mild and pleasant, and that night a full moon rose and shone down from the clear skies. The skybound century cast a pale light over the lapping waters on, of the southwest shore of Lake Michigan. It was quiet save the calls and beating wings of various ducks, gulls, and herons. They would occasionally alight on the now unrecognizable husk of the progress. She rested on her side, in the mud of the harbor of the Calumet, a stench-filled point where the mouth of the Calumet River vainly tried to discharge the accumulation of industrial waste and sewage into Lake Michigan. But the current of the river was not strong enough and inky pools of oil, livestock blood, and muck collected and shimmered in the moonlight. While steel mills, chemical plants, and packing houses upriver belched and buzzed as a busy hive of modern labor, the atmosphere here was decidedly more graveyard-esque. Surrounding the progress of the more bound bodies of other vessels in varying states of decay and disrepair. Here was the derelict schooner Mary E. Dykes, damaged in a storm and now poking out from the fetid waters. Over there, just a few feet away from the progress, was the John A. Dix, a Civil War era cutter that was falling apart bit by bit. The motley collection had long ago been picked over for anything of worth, but the progress especially had pro proven a boon for scavengers over the years. The copper from her hull had disappeared early on. Most of the usable wood went next, taken by men and women who lived on the margins and needed the easily burnable kindling to stay warm. The remaining shell was rank and rotting, part of an inconvenient assemblage that made navigating the Calumet difficult for modern ships. This is where the progress of star story ended, on her side in the foul, fetid waters around Chicago. It would be nearly two years longer before fire and dynamite would finally finish the job, and the few scraps of remaining wood long since shed of their gleaming red paint would settle into the muddy bottom only, where only the demolition team and flocks of startled birds would bear witness to this ignominious finale. In between these two moments is a rich tapestry of expectations and disappointments, assumptions and failures that carry a deep resonance today. The sentiments of the whaling industry in the 1890s echo across modern communities of coal miners and steel workers, newspaper journalists and video store owners. Those who find themselves in a dying industry are often beset by more than just questions about 
economic security and hope for the future. They also begin to ask questions about their legacy and place in the larger narrative of American history. Will they be forgotten? Will they be understood? Will they be pitied or celebrated? And who gets to decide? So with that, that's sort of uh, an introduction to, to the book. Um, and I think sort of sets up why I, I be, one reason I became so interested in the story, um, you know, basically the story of a failure and, and sort of untangling why, why that happened. So I'll turn it over to, to Ted and I, I think we can begin our conversation and, and talk a little bit more about this uh, strange piece of Chicago history, given, given that it's a, about a whaling ship. So I'm going to go ahead and share some slides as we go along, uh, Dan and I talking here, uh, just to go ahead and uh, illustrate things uh, a little bit. Uh, and on this first slide, Dan, uh, is something that you talked about early in the book. And it relates to the way in which the whaling industry was so intimately identified with the uh, community of New Bedford. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the uh, seal on the right side of the slide. So this, this is a really interesting question um, and sort of goes back to sort of the purpose of the book is, you know, what, what went so wrong? Why, why was this such a complete failure? And, and part, of, part of answering that question was, was figuring out how far I needed to go back. You know, when does this story really begin? And so, you know, the structure of the book is such that you really don't, you know, start reading about the progress making its way to Chicago until about the halfway point. And, the, and what you're talking about with the seal is, is the starting point that I picked. And this moment that we're looking at is when New Bedford became incorporated as a city. Um, and, you know, one of the things they wanted to do was create a city seal. Uh, one of the sort of humorous things about this is they actually had, well, I guess it, I would, technically it would be the town seal prior to this. Um, unfortunately, the artist got it wrong um, and, and sort of screwed it up. So when it became a city, they sort of had a chance to do a redo. They sort of were able to hit the reset button. And then the seal you see in front of you on the screen um, is the result of that. And I think there's a couple of interesting things about this. First of all, you can see the whaling ship. Um, and, and just how important um, it is given, you know, sort of its, its, its relationship to everything else in the seal. Um, and then you also have this motto, uh, Lusum Defunda. And um, that also changed between um, the original seal and, and the one that we see here that, you know, is still in use today. The original one, uh, the Latin roughly translated to, to lighting the world. This one is translated as we light the world. And it's, it's not a huge change, but I think it's an important one because what it does is it makes the, the, the tense much more active. We light the world, New Bedford lights the world. And I found that important. I found that to be an important moment because you know, in this question of what went so wrong, you have to ask, how did the community, how did New Bedford start to see itself so uniquely? So uh, how do they revere this industry so much that you know, they, they sort of assumed everything would go OK, and it obviously didn't? But this is sort of a beginning moment of that, um, this idea of them actively lighting the world. And, one of the things I discovered in my research that I found really interesting and important is the, um, the importance of the Quaker faith and those that, that pursued whaling um, as, as an industry, those that invested, those that became wealthy, those that became New Bedford's elite um, were almost all Quakers. And if you know anything about the Quaker faith, you know that it's extremely deeply rooted in metaphors about light and dark. You know, pushing back the, the darkness, bringing forth the light, um, you know, uh, images of, of, of the Savior, images of, of God are always rooted very much, very deeply in, in metaphors of light. And so the fact that this town was engaged in 
the an occupation that produced things that created light, uh, candles, whale oil, uh, lighthouse oil, sperm oil. You know, all these things that literally pushed back darkness also had this sort of religious sheen, this almost um, uh, evangelical layer to it. And so I start the book at this moment, I start the book with this seal to sort of capture that, that sense of importance, that sense of doing not just industrial work, not just um, profitable work, not just uh, capitalist work, but almost God's work, almost religious work, almost evangelical uh, zeal to this idea of lighting the world. Um, hence, hence the motto, uh, Lucem de Funda. So, so Dan, that's, that's how New Bedford kind of defines its identity, begins its, its romance uh, with the hunting of the whale. How did you uh, begin your search uh, for the story of the progress and why? Um, so it's actually um, something that I don't think is, is hugely common among historians. Um, this is actually a bit of family history. Um, so my great-great-grandfather, uh, who features very prominently in the book, was also named Daniel Gifford, um, Captain Daniel Gifford, nicknamed Bloody Dan Gifford, which maybe gives you a little sense of his personality. Um, and he was the one that, oh, yep, just saw him pass by there. He was the one that actually brought the captains, the progress from New Bedford to Chicago. Um, so he was the captain um, on board. He was the captain. There was a, a crew from New Bedford. Uh, he was in charge of that crew um, as, the, as the progress traveled from New Bedford to Chicago. I was totally unaware of this. I knew, you know, family history, we knew that we had a whaler in the family. We knew, you know, Captain Gifford, you know, was, was part of the family lineage, but knew nothing about the story of, of the progress or the trip to Chicago or the World's Fair. Um, and it was, it was actually a line in his obituary. It was a line um, when I was just doing some genealogy. And actually, you know, even before I ever went to grad school, um, had, had sort of stumbled into this uh, clipping that, of his obituary. And there was this one line in it that said, and Captain Gifford took the progress uh, from New Bedford to Chicago for the World's Fair. And, you know, it was just one of these things that sort of, you know, well, first of all, how do you even get a whale ship to Chicago? Um, but it was one of those things that stuck with me. And, you know, I, I went through grad school, you know, I came out on the other side. And this was one of those projects that, you know, it's, it's a classic back burner project. One of those things where, you know, I, I'd have a little fit and start of, of research and I sort of collect and then that would go into a bin and then, you know, files that would collect dust. And, and finally, I just sort of had this moment where I, I really wanted to tell this story. I wanted to find out more about this, this one sentence um, and, and really understand what this was all about. So, um, you know, it was actually a, a family connection that brought me to uh, the story. But as, as Jim pointed out, you know, my, one of my interests is, uh, is museum studies and, and the place of museums in American culture. And so, you know, that sort of developed as well. Once, once I figured out what was going on, um, you know, that was sort of my other hook um, into this. So let's go back to uh, the early history of the progress, just briefly. Uh, the progress didn't start off as a museum exhibit. <laughs> uh, how did, how did the, this vessel begin its career? Sure. So it was, uh, you know, launched, um, I believe, in the 1840s. I think 1842. It was launched. It was actually originally named uh, the Charles Phelps. Um, it was later renamed the Progress, um, and it had, you know, sort of a a traditional whaling career, and so one that sort of tracks the rise and fall of of whaling. So you know, when it launches in the 1840s, actually out of uh, Rhode Island. I was where it was built. Um, you know, whaling is sort of at its peak. It's or it's it's you know one of America's preeminent uh, uh, industries. 
uh, William Seward uh, actually calls it America's favorite industry. I don't know if you know, that's necessarily true, uh, but it was, it was extremely prominent, extremely important, um, extremely profitable. Um, and you know, sometime before the Civil War, but certainly after the Civil War, it begins, the industry begins as this decline. And, and, by, and at this point, you know, the, the renamed Bark Progress, you know, is part of that. Um, it survives the Civil War. Um, a lot of whaling ships didn't. Um, uh, and eventually is sort of repositioned, redirected to the Arctic. And this marks sort of a, an interesting turning point for, for whaling where um, the development of uh, petroleum products, the discovery of uh, petroleom products coming out of uh, Pennsylvania and other other states, um, as well as the introduction of, of natural gas, uh, whale oil isn't needed for lighting as much um, anymore. Interestingly enough, lighthouses continue to, to burn whale oil. That's from sperm oil. Um, but whaling sort of has the second life that it gets not from pursuing blubber, but by pursuing baleen. And baleen are those long uh, bits of cartilage that, that toothless whales use um, to, to feed. You know, they, they suck in all the water, it goes through these the sieve, um, the baleen forms, and that's how they feed on krill. For humans, those, that baleen, uh, sometimes called whale bone, er erroneously, um, could also be shaped very easily. It was sort of uh, the same way you might think of plastics today. Um, so it could be easily bent into uh, eyeglasses, um, umbrellas, but most importantly, women's corsets. And so whaling sort of has the second life uh, in the pursuit of baleen as opposed to whale oil. Why is that relevant? Because that sends all these whalers to the Arctic. Uh, toothless whales, baleen whales congregate, you know, in these very dangerous conditions, these very dangerous waters in the Arctic, um, and whalers have to go up into, you know, well past the, the North Pole, or, you know, the, the um, you know, to the North Pole, the Arctic Circle, in pursuit of them in pursuit of, of this sort of new bounty uh, from whales. And the progress is part of that. Um, and all of this sort of comes to a head in the 1870s when there is a disaster, uh, the Arctic uh, disaster in which, uh, 1871, in which almost all of the New Bedford fleet that is up there gets trapped in ice. Um, it was a weird winter. Um, the, the whalers you know, really didn't pay attention to some of the warnings from the indigenous population. And you know, they sort of rush in when there's uh, a chance uh, to, to, to hit, go into these waters. And very quickly, uh, the ice just sort of reemerges, reconverges, and crushes. Just you know, one, one account describes it as uh, an eggshell being crushed. Um, ship after ship after ship, and as, as you point out, 33 ships. The Progress was one of the few that wasn't crushed. It was far enough south, and it stayed far enough south that it was still there. Amazingly, think of 33 ships with all of their crew, captain's crew, including some women and children that, that traveled with, with the captain, um, that was sort of his prerogative to sometimes bring uh, family. All of them had to escape over this ice through the channels to the very few ships that remained outside of, of the ice. And the progress was one of those. And so over a thousand men, women, and children go through this ice and manage to escape uh, down a very narrow channel to the progress and a handful of other ships that are that have managed to survive, and then they all, uh, all thousand plus on on these five ships, uh, head to to Honolulu. So the progress sort of has this moment of fame, uh, where you know it it sort of gets retold um, 
over and over again as one of the rescue ships in, in the Arctic disaster of 1871. But has a little bit of, of fame uh, prior to, to the World's Fair. So, um, but, you know, sort of has this, as I say, it's sort of, you know, this, this very um, representative career of, of, you know, launching in, in sort of the golden age, going through the, the heyday of, of sperm whale uh, pursuit, especially in right whale, um, then the Civil War coming out on the other side, and then um, on up to the Arctic. And then by the 1890s, uh, when we get to, um, to the World's Fair, um, it's, it's basically in dock. It's, it's sort of rotting um, in its birth in the New Bedford docks um, and, and hasn't gone a whaling for, for many, many, many years. So whaling by 1892 is in a pretty sorry state as a business. And yet uh, New Bedford, when they hear about this World's Fair, that Chicago is trumpeting all across the country to drum up support for people to come to it, uh, New Bedford hits upon an idea uh, to go ahead and send a ship. Eventually, of course, it's the progress, but to send a ship. What, what is the rationale for New Bedford to put energy and artifacts into the creation of this exhibit? So by the 1890s, not only do you have whaling um, as a diminishing industry, but you also have the rise of another industry in, in New Bedford, and that's cotton manufacturing, cotton mills. Um, and, you know, you might be familiar with other mill towns in, in Massachusetts, Lowell you know, is, is perhaps one of the more famous ones. New Bedford was a little bit late to the game, and, um, and um, part of that was because of whaling. People, be, while people can make money in whaling, um, you know, they sort of pushed back uh, other industries. Uh, but by the 1870s, 1880s, and 1890s, um, it becomes clear that, that whaling, you know, is diminishing, it's not as profitable, uh, money can be made in cotton, and so it's sort of the dynamic of New Bedford is changing. Um, but what's so interesting is these same families that made their fortune um, in, in whaling are now putting that money into cotton manufacturing. And then there's this sort of smaller coterie of, of families that, that keep with, with whaling. Even though it's a declining industry, it's not dead. You know, there's still whale ships that go out each year. You know, in the 1890s, there's still whale oil and baleen um, that comes, you know, through various ports each year. So, you know, there's this sort of tension in New Bedford that I try to draw out in my book between, you know, those that are still pursuing this industry um, and those that sort of remember it fondly, but have moved on. And sort of where these two can meet, where these two tribes, if you want to call it that, or where these two groups can sort of meet in the middle is commemoration, memorialization. Um, the idea of, of making something of, new, of whaling, whaling's history. Um, even though it's not history for some, even though it's not history for Captain Gifford, for example, um, for many it is. And so they sort of pick up on this idea of a museum um, at the World's Fair um, in order to, to sort of honor New Bedford's history. But I think in a, in, a, in a way, what I try to draw out is, I think it's maybe a little more emotionally complicated than that. Um, it's not just you know, honoring the past, but also sort of balancing the scales, you know, sort of recognizing that a lot of these families have moved on from whaling uh, when that was what made their fortunes. And perhaps this is a, a way of, of sort of balancing the scales uh, of that a little bit. Um, you know, as you say, they, they picked the progress. Um, there was someone else that, that actually did a lot of the legwork, uh, but had a much smaller vessel um, and he gets sort of passed over um, in favor of, of this whale ship, uh, the progress um, that gets picked. Um, and, the, and, you know, the sort of package is put together of we can send a whale ship and, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, 
the elements of whaling uh, to Chicago. Um, the other piece I will just jump in real quick on um, that I think is interesting is, you know, a lot of this work of memorializing whaling, um, you know, sort of educating the public about whaling had been done by the Smithsonian in previous exhibitions. In fact, here in Louisville and in the New Orleans, uh, what was then known as the National Museum had sort of stepped up and done pretty elaborate displays of, of whaling um, for those exhibitions. Um, well, lots of models, dioramas, a big sort of canvas, painted canvas, um, this sort of pyramid of all the whaling instruments, you know, leading up to, you know, some uh, peak. Uh, but by the Columbian Exposition, by Chicago, um, their attention really had turned to anthropology and the sort of growing field of anthropology. And they just basically said, we can't do whaling. You know, it's, it's not, not in our purview. It's, we're just, we're not in that game anymore. And so there was this opening to, for New Bedford, not only to sort of honor its past and sort of, you know, work with, with those that, that still considered whaling to be important to New Bedford, but also to sort of take the place of an institution that had been filling that, that sort of didactic educational role uh, up, until, up until Chicago. So they outfit the ship uh, and uh, uh, you can barely see it here, the picture Dan shared with us earlier, uh, and they send it to Chicago. Uh, but I thought it was kind of interesting. They've got this perfectly functional sailing vessel and she's ingloriously towed up the Atlantic coast into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, and tell me a little about her progress, you know, through the Great Lakes and to getting to Chicago. Yeah, so, and I think this is a real important crux to the story is, you know, we've talked a lot about New Bedford. So far, you know, New Bedford's whaling history. New Bedford came up with this idea. The New Bedford Board of Trade picked the ship. But it's Chicago that actually makes this happen. It's a Chicago syndicate that actually comes and buys the progress. And that syndicate is headed up by a Chicago coal baron named Henry Weaver. And Henry Weaver made his fortune. And he's this sort of classic Chicago story. Up, up from his bootstraps, he was. Uh, from, you know, sort of upstate New York, grew up on a farm, but he comes to Chicago, sort of a small time uh, coal dealer, but he, he, he knows how to schmooze. He knows how to make connections and he gets in really tight with municipal institutions. So all of the jails and hospitals and schools and anything else that was a Chicago municipal um, institution um, all those buildings were supplied, their coal was supplied by Henry Weaver. And so Henry Weaver makes, a, you know, basically becomes a, a Chicago millionaire off of this. Henry Weaver now owns the progress. Um, and it's a syndicate, you know, there, there, there are a few others that bought, bought shares. Henry Weaver is, is the majority owner. What he knows about whaling you know, is probably, you know, the sum of dime novels and, and, and fiction, you know, in magazines. And so, you know, he buys it, he puts sort of his lieutenant is this really sort of, you know, interesting um, sort of silver tongued uh, smooth talker uh, who's a horse guy. You know, he's a superintendent of one of the, the prominent liveries in Chicago. Uh, puts him in charge, puts him on the on the vessel, and 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 then you know my ancestor and the New Bedford crew to 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 actually bring it to Chicago. So it's so I, mean, I to get to your question, you know, of this sort of unceremonious towing. Um, you know, part of it is that you know. The Chicago side of, of this, you know, wants to preserve the whale ship, wants to preserve the sails, wants to preserve, um, and and you know, and and parts of this of of the journey can't be done 
uh, other than by towing. Um, and so, you know, you have this sort of tension between the Chicago syndicate, whose job it is to get it to Chicago, and this traditional New Bedford whaling crew um, that are used to being out at sea. Um, and it becomes very clear very early on that the New Bedford side of the equation is pretty unhappy. Um, they do not like this idea that they're being towed. Uh, they don't like the idea that they're in freshwater. Um, once they hit the canal system, Lachine Canal and the Welland Canal, um, and there's bridges to deal with, all of those beautiful masts you see have to come down. So, you know, this beautiful whaling bark basically gets stripped uh, down to its bare bones and all of that's loaded onto barges. Um, you know, the keel is removed. It has to be as light as possible. And even then, you know, the, the whaling crew sort of grouses about all the, the scrapes and bumps um, that the, the poor, poor old gal is taking um, in this journey. Um, and, and so reporters sort of along the way um, note uh, how, you know, these old tars, these sort of salty old mariners um, really are not uh, all that happy about their, their journey to, to Chicago. And yet on the other side, you have the Chicago uh, owners and investors that are trying to build up excitement, trying to build up, um, you know, the, the buzz and the, the hype um, around this whale ship that's, that's coming to Chicago um, and all these intermediate stops along the way. So eventually uh, they make their way uh, through, the, through the Great Lakes. Uh, a couple of their stops, you talk about how the uh, visitors to the ship start looting artifacts from the museum. Uh, and this makes Captain Dan a little upset. And he's not, Bloody Dan is not somebody you want to get upset. <laughs> and he, he starts like even saying, we don't want people on the boat, which, but eventually they get to Milwaukee. Tell me about the time, because they spend a considerable amount of time in Milwaukee, don't they? Or they do, so they sort of split their time between Milwaukee and Racine as sort of the last, last stops before, before the big debut in Chicago. And, and this is where, you know, I think if you go back to sort of my original premise, you know, what went so wrong? Um, you know, that journey that we just talked about. So the other stops that it makes, um, it stops in Buffalo. Um, it stops in Montreal. First, first, first one's Montreal. Second one's Buffalo. By Detroit is when Bloody Dan has, has had enough of, of everybody, so he won't let anybody on board anymore, which I'm sure drives the Chicago side of the, the equation crazy because it has lost ticket sales. Um, and then they finally make it to, to Milwaukee and, and Racine. And by that point, you really have a sense of what this museum has become. So if you start, if you start back in New Bedford and even you know, that first stop in Montreal, what you have is really a, a pretty authentic, you know, it's, it's, it's not, like you say, it's still being towed. I mean, how, how authentic is it, you know, really? But, but more or less a pretty authentic whaling museum experience. Um, you know, those press accounts out of, out of Montreal, especially, you know, they were seeing the, the tools, they were seeing the harpoons, they were seeing the tri work, they were, they were Visitors were getting a full explanation of what whaling entailed and what the process was and what the steps were and what the jargon was. And so step by step, little by little, that begins to change. And so by the time you get to Milwaukee and Racine, um, it's really become something else. It's become, and, and, and there's a banner that's created um, you know, by, by the end that announces that it's a museum of 10,000 marine curiosities. Um, and so this idea that New Bedford had of this very sort of educational, um, didactic, you know, we're really gonna, you know, walk people through whaling and what it is and why it's important. And um, that really has shifted into something that's much more eclectic and much more um, based on just, you know, sort of 
marine bric-a-brac from, from around the world. Um, and by the time you get to Milwaukee and Racine, you know, they've had a chance to sort of pull everything out, put it all in its cases, and the entire, um, you know, space between decks is basically turned over to this new museum, this new idea of a museum of marine curiosities. When I say marine curiosities, it, it was everything. It was seashells. It was coral. It was bird feathers. It was stuffed giant turtles. Um, it was a mummy, a mummified boy from Australia. Um, it was supposedly the sextant, sextant off the Mayflower. Um, it was artifacts from the, the Greeley expedition. It was uh, Eskimo clothes. I mean, anything you can imagine other than stuff that actually was related to whaling um, had become sort of the uh, underpinning of, of the museum um, by the time it arrives you know, into the Great Lakes and, and ultimately. So, so Dan, um, at the, when they're in Milwaukee, something happens that I think has some interesting sort of racial overtones. Uh, the crew uh, had, who'd come from New Bedford is discharged. And of course, at this time in the history of whaling, a lot of the crews for New Bedford ships were, were not stout New England lads, but uh, uh, men who had signed on in the Azores or the Cape Verde Islands, uh, many of whom uh, were essentially African. Do you think this was a factor in why they discharged the crew? Because initially they said, we're going to have the authentic crew and we're going to reenact whaling for the people of Chicago. Absolutely. It, it's, it's, you know, it's one of these layers that I just find so fascinating in, in this story. Um, you know, and one of the things that the crew says, um, you know, when they're being discharged is it was their understanding that they were going to be, you know, part of this for 18 months. Um, where does 18 months come from? Well, if you map out uh, when the fair would have been over, the end, the, the end of the Columbian Exposition, um, they thought they were going to be there through the end. They thought they were there in order to be uh, basically what we, today we would call interpreters, the interpretive staff um, for, for this whale ship. Um, and they're sort of unceremoniously dumped um, there in Racine, Milwaukee, um, and told, no, you're not, you're not going to Chicago. You're not being part of, going to be part of this. Um, your job is done. And, you know, it wasn't uncommon, as you say, a lot of these, uh, this particular crew uh, was very, very typical of what the makeup would have been by the 1890s of those whale ships that still were uh, going out, uh, many from the Azores, many from the Cape Verde Islands, a handful of Pacific Islanders. Uh, but not literate men, um, not men that read their contracts closely, uh, that would have understood, you know, the terms and conditions. So, you know, the fact that there was a dispute over the contract was, actually wasn't that unusual, but the fact that they weren't, that the authentic New Bedford whaling crew wasn't going to the Chicago World's Fair in order to be part of the authentic whaling museum had to sting. And the fact that they were men of color had to sting. But even Captain Gifford, you know, uh, had to stay with the ship a little bit longer until it actually made it to Chicago. But even he didn't stay with it uh, afterwards. He, he goes back to New Bedford and, and actually gives an interview um, in which he says how unhappy he is, how unhappy that the crew was dismissed, um, that you sort of read that between the lines but says, you know, very unhappy, and he's explicit about this, that it isn't a whaling museum, that, you know, there's no interest in, in whaling. He says, the, you know, it's, they've, they filled it with electric lights, um, and all you have on board are a bunch of clerks, including women, which, you know, drives him a little crazy. And then sort of the denouement, the, you know, sort of the ultimate insult that the entire enterprise is dedicated to the sale of seashells. Um, and so, you know, you have, um, you, you know, the captain of the, of this authentic New Bedford crew, including, you know, all these men of color, um, very unhappy about the, the turn that this has taken. Um, 
as for who actually did uh, participate uh, in the whaling museum, um, by all accounts, it was uh, sailors off of some schooners, uh, some some Lake Michigan schooners that that stood in for for the whaling crew. Um, there was one. I do have to mention this though. There was one particular individual uh, who was an original crew member, who as far as I know, did not make it all the way to the fair, but was displayed, was part of the museum uh, for a few weeks or a few months uh, after his arrival in Chicago. And the reason we know this is he was listed in the promotional material as, the, as a Fiji king, the first Fiji king, the first member of royalty to ever visit Chicago. Now, the fact that this sort of royal persona has suddenly materialized just as the crew is being dismissed and they're arriving in Chicago um, is not a coincidence. His name was Jimmy Kanaka. Kanaka was sort of a catch-all term for anyone from the South, South Sea, South Islands. Um, and his, his sort of calling card, his sort of hallmark was that he was heavily tattooed. Um, tattoos basically from head to toe. And so the fact that he was so exotic, so exotic looking, um, made him marketable, made him a commodity uh, for this new uh, Museum of Marine Curiosities because he himself is a curiosity. And so they sort of fashion him what, you know, what they, he came up with the idea, you know, Henry Weaver and the syndicate came up with the idea, but someone turns him into uh, the first Fiji king ever to visit uh, Chicago, and that that is actually in some of the promotion materials. Yeah, I suspect he was probably the last Fiji king who visited <laughs> Chicago as well. <laughs> but uh, so uh, eventually, uh, all these dignitaries they climb onto the vessel in Milwaukee, and the ship's towed into Chicago. But it's before the Columbian Exposition has started, and so Weaver seizes this opportunity to make some money with this very uh, splendid uh, ship uh, and he moors it in the Chicago River and seeks out visitors to come and start paying for the progress. Yeah, and, and this is sort of the beginning of the end. Oh, great, uh, great ticket there. Um, I mean, this still just boggles my mind. I mean, you know, I, I didn't, I've been to Chicago many times. I didn't grow up in Chicago, but, but I know enough about Chicago to know that a whaling ship at the end of the State Street Bridge in the middle of Gilded Age commerce is a bad idea. And yet Henry Weaver, you know, uses this connection. So it starts out um, out of the pier in Lake Michigan, and it's too hard to get to, you know, it's not real popular. He uses its connections to get this whale ship towed right there in the heart of Chicago, right there at the State Street Bridge. And it, by all accounts, it's, it starts out pretty popular. It starts out, um, you know, as, you know, as you can imagine, you know, pr a pretty unusual attraction. Um, the, the image on the right is the four-page brochure um, that came with this. Um, as you can see, you know, uh, the ship is, is like, the text within it describes whaling for about 50 to 60 words, and then three and three quarters pages of everything else, um, including the fact that the ship is unsinkable because it's so strong, uh, the, the wood is made of is so strong, which is probably bad, you know, bad mojo on the fact for for the uh, people that that put that in print because, sure enough, in the midst of all of this traffic uh, on the Chicago River, um, a a scow hits the Progress, smack in the bow, drives a huge hole in it, and it goes straight down into the Chicago River, which is basically at at, at this point in the 1890s, it's more like an open sewer. Um, with 200 school children on board. Um, all escape. It's, it's a pretty comical um, description. Um, but of course, you know, anybody that, you know, and, and 
I'm talking to the Chicago Maritime Museum that I think, you know, knows this far too well, you know, the artifacts um, are just, you know, immediately put in danger. They're covered with, with muck, they're covered with sewage. And it just is this blow to the progress from which it never really recovers. Um, Henry Weaver manages to get it back up, uh, manages to repair it, manages to clean off the artifacts, um, and manages to then sort of limp along to the fairgrounds uh, for you know, the building of the Columbian Exposition um, sort of built around um, this whale ship. But that moment, I think, is sort of a pivotal moment in this story um, where sort of the combination of the kind of ship that it became, the kind of museum it became, um, along with the sort of, um, you know, really bad circumstance to, to its publicity, to its, its, its image, uh, sort of converge and sort of cast this pall over it by the time it, it actually makes it to, to the, ex the uh, Columbian Exposition grounds. And so here we have uh, the splendid white city. It's all visitors, they say, you know, something like 20% of the American population came to the uh, Columbian Exposition. Uh, to see, you know, such splendid sights. Uh, the Statue of the Republic. The marvelous fairs and the, the uh, incredible sculptures, all of which unfortunately <laughs> were done in plaster <laughs> and could not be preserved. And here, uh, Dan's provided us with an arrow that shows, okay, here's the splendid white city, right? This is what everybody's coming to see. And where did the whaling ship progress end up? She ended up at, like at some back lagoon, <laughs> like the basement of the fair. Um, and very interestingly, they built the bridge <laughs> to make sure that the, the poor whaling ship couldn't escape from, its, from that awful birth that it was given. Uh, so uh, Dan, tell us a little bit about the, the role that it played in the, in, in the Columbian Exposition. Well, so, I mean, I think, uh, I think this picture speaks, speaks volumes. They actually called it the Frog Pond. Um, the, the South Pond, the South Pond was the technical name. The Frog Pond is what everyone called it. Um, and I think, I think this sort of, you know, sums up, you know, the fact that, you know, for all of New Bedford's hopes and dreams and for this, this sort of, you know, ode to whaling, this sort of, you know, pristine museum that would, would show the world, you know, the importance of whaling, it just gets lost. Um, as, and, you know, the fact that it really wasn't about whaling anymore, um, the fact that, you know, it was sort of tucked off in this corner, and the fact that, you know, the Columbian Exposition was celebrating in many ways modernity, was celebrating progress, was celebrating the fact that America, you know, was on the same industrial and imperial stage as the rest of the world. So looking backwards to this, this bygone era, um, of whaling, you know, didn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, and so there's really no other, well, and as you know, from, from the part I read at the very beginning, you know, ultimately this was a failure. Um, it was a huge financial failure for uh, Henry Weaver. Um, he actually goes into receivership during all of this uh, and, and basically loses any, any money he put uh, into this. Um, one of the prob one of the many problems um, is this was actually a ticketed attraction. We saw saw one of those tickets, um, you know, in an earlier slide. Um, that was common for the midway. The midway was the sort of carnival part of the Columbian Exposition. It's where the the Ferris wheel was. It's where the belly dance uh, was. It's where you, know, you could go on a camel ride for a quarter. But the white city, what we're looking at here, um, was all meant to be 
included in the ticket price. And there were only three things that weren't included that were part of the white city that weren't included in the ticket price. Uh, one was um, a, a reconstruction of Anastasi ruins and um, that you see in, in Colorado. Uh, one was the uh, gondola system. And the third was the progress. So, you know, on top of, you know, maybe it, it, it not being the right museum, the right tone, the right place, you also had this problem of people didn't want to pay what was essentially, you know, it, it was 25 cents to go on, which kind of amounts to uh, a full price movie ticket. Like if you buy one of the, you know, IMAX 3D, you know, primetime movie tickets, this is about the equivalent. So it wasn't, it wasn't out of reach, but it wasn't cheap. People had to really want to see it. If you look at it, you know, you can see, you can walk by it. You can see the ship, you know, sort of sitting, you know, you know, sort of picturesquely in the water. Um, you can say, oh, wow, cool. They have a whale ship here. But do you really need to pay money to go on board? You really need to pay money to see, um, you know, this museum that is as much, you know, an eclectic bunch of hodgepodge as it is, you know, something that that's really engaging and really, you know, significant to your time at the Columbian Exposition. So, um, you know, on top of, um, you know, all the problems that it had, you know, sinking in the Chicago River, you know, I think it just has this real problem finding its place and finding its voice um, once it's at the at the fairgrounds. And as, as Ted mentioned, you know, it has to be moved in early so that they can build all those bridges around it and sort of encase it, you know, in this in this spot. Um, and so it spends many months, including winter, which, you know, Chicago winters are not kind on anything, much less uh, a whale ship that's, you know, seen better days. Um, you know, basically just sitting in the frog pond, uh, waiting for the fair to open. Um, so it's many months of revenue, of lost revenue uh, for that reason as well. So progress doesn't get a heck of a lot of visitors. Um, the fair, uh, Weaver comes in, goes into bankruptcy, comes out of bankruptcy. Uh, the, the syndicate surely must have gone ahead and been a financial failure. Uh, uh, and uh, what happens to the progress in the wake of uh, its time uh, in Chicago? Well, there's sort of two answers to that. There's what happened to the progress and what happened to everything on the progress. So I'll answer the second question first. So Henry Weaver does have one final trick up his sleeve. Um, he, he, he lost his shirt, there's no, no doubt about that, but he does manage to secure a pretty tidy sum um, for all of the objects, all those marine curiosities, those 10,000 marine curiosities between decks, um, he manages to find a buyer for that. And the buyer is the new Columbian Field Museum. And so the Field Museum gets all of, these, all of the stuff that was on the progress. And that becomes one of the basis, one of the major founding collections of, of the Field Museum. Um, and there's you know, more to that, that that we can talk about. The progress itself has a, a sadder history. You know, basically Henry Weaver abandons it. He says, you know, wash my hands of it, you know, get everything out of there, get everything, you know, get all the stuff, uh, but basically just leaves it in the frog pond. Um, and so it starts to deteriorate as the fair deteriorates. You know, the fair action, fairgrounds, you know, of course, we're all meant to be temporary. Um, it's all temporary structures. There's two fires that sort of wipe out huge parts of the fair, which, you know, here you have this whale oil soaked wooden ship that somehow survives two major fires on the fairground. I don't know how it's it managed to do that, but it does. And eventually it, it becomes so deteriorated, it's becoming a public nuisance. You know, kids, you know, are climbing on it. Parents are freaking out that their kids are climbing on it. 
um, you know, it's attracting, you know, vagrants. Um, and so they managed to get it out, pull it across the sand, basically, you know, the silt that's, that's formed into the frog pond, get it down into Lake Michigan, where it promptly sinks. Um, they, man they raise it a couple times. They try to come up with different ideas for it. Nothing ever really sticks. And it sort of gets, you know, towed around until this final resting spot at the mouth of the Calumet. Um, and that's where it, it meets its final end uh, with uh, fire and dynamite um, in, uh, in 1902. Um, a full 10 years after it departed from, from New Bedford. Um, and what's so interesting about that timing is, you know, even though this is now a Chicago story, even though this is part of Chicago history, um, New Bedford was fully aware of this fate. Um, there are all these stories that go back to New Bedford's newspapers um, about the progress over these 10 years, um, including its, its final sort of, you know, sad ending. And within just a few months of that, um, New Bedford itself has gathered um, and started to plan, started to think about creating a whaling museum. Uh, but this time a whaling museum in New Bedford um, that's part of the community. And what's so interesting about this discussion is the, is the complete amnesia about the progress. No one talks about it. No one mentions that this, this failed museum, this failed idea, the, you know, the, the, the artifacts that already went to Chicago and never came home. The whale ship that went to Chicago and never came home. Um, you know, that sort of gets scrubbed from the narrative and yet the timing is such that as soon as this finally ends, uh, New Bedford as a community comes together and creates what's now you know, a world-class institution, the New Bedford Whaling Museum and one of the, the premier uh, maritime museums, I think you know, many people would agree, um, you know, dedicated to whaling history and, and, and science and education. It's, it's sort of ironic. I mean, a splendid central exhibit at the museum, of course, is a uh, reduced scale model of a whaling ship. But they'd let the real thing get away. And you got to go to Mystic if you want to see the last American whaling ship, um, the Morgan. But uh, they still, it, it, with this exhibit, you know, it seems like they, they still wanted to try to get across the notion of what it would have been like to, to be on a whaler. Uh, and there's, there's an interesting little coda to that, that story about the Morgan, which of course, you know, had been in New Bedford as well. Um, when the New York World's Fair uh, of the 1930s uh, was, was being planned, there was a syndicate. Tell me if you've heard this story before. <laughs> There's a syndicate uh, from New York affiliated with the World's Fair that wants to take the last remaining whale ship um, from, the, from the American whaling fleet to the New York World's Fair. And, and the, what, the, the guy, guy that becomes the curator of the whaling museum um, says no. We're not going to do it, even though the Morgan is not in great shape, even though, you know, it could use a little bit of love. Um, he says, I remember, and this is the only time that anyone sort of mentions the progress um, in this context. I remember what happened to the progress and the Chicago World's Fair, and it never came home, and we're not going to send another whale ship to another World's Fair and repeat history. And so they hold on to it, and then uh, make arrangements uh, you know, a few years later for it to, to go to Mystic, where it still is to this day. Well, Dan, I've had the privilege of asking you a number of questions, and I'm wondering if uh, our audience would like to go ahead and uh, have some of their questions answered. Absolutely. I'd be happy to answer. Jim, do you Just remember, if you want to ask a question, unmute yourself. Okay, this is John Melissa, and my, I have several questions, but one is, are there any plans of the progress around? Now, typically, these ships were kind of like Chevys. They were all the same. 
<laughs> so um, there are a couple models. Um, um, I think Mystic has one. I don't think there's one in the New Bedford collection. Um, but there are photographs. There are, um, you know, as I say, models. But one of the most interesting pieces of this actually managed to make it back to Rhode Island, where, where, where the ship was built, when it was still the, the Charles Phelps. Um, and it turned out that the grandson of one of the builders um, visited the, the progress while it was, you know, on its side, while it was decaying here in, or there in Chicago at the Calumet River. And he saved the billet head. Uh, the piece that, you know, it's not the, a mermaid, it's, it's this piece that is on the front of the, the ship. He saved it and he shipped it to the Wesley uh, Library in Rhode Island and said, you know, don't know if you want this, but this is a piece of Rhode Island history. And, you know, it's off this ship in Chicago um, that I don't think is going to be around much more. And sure enough, you know, the it caught fire. Uh, not too long after that. Um, and that is still in Rhode Island to this day. It's actually you know, in the Wesley uh, uh, Library uh, in, in the town of Rhode Island. So um, that is the only piece that's the piece of the, of the ship that survives, um, as well as of course the, the collection um, that's in, in the Field Museum. Okay, I had another question and that is, Obviously, to go through the Welland Canal, they had to derig the ship. Can't go through the Welland Canal with the mast. When and where did they re-rig the ship? Uh, Buffalo. So they got got to Buffalo, and and that's when they start uh, to put it together. But you know, the fact of the matter is, it didn't look like a whale ship uh, when it arrived, and the the press was pretty harsh, um, and so. You know, one of the things I try to draw out in my book is this this sort of tension between the ideal of whaling and the ideal of a whale ship and the reality. You know, the reality that to go through the Welland Canal, you have to take everything off and strip it down to, you know, basically it's knickers. And, and you know, it doesn't look like a whale ship anymore. And the press sort of had a field day with that and, and, and look to the crew um, you know, who seems sort of, you know, embarrassed to be on this, this whale ship that, that doesn't look like it should anymore. It doesn't look like, you know, the sort of uh, premier whaling vessel that, that they hope to present, present to the world. Okay. Sam, if you'd like to unmute yourself and explain to everyone first what first and fastest is, because only because of you do I know what that is and uh, explain your comment. Okay, thank you, James. Um, yeah, First and Fastest is the uh, magazine <clears throat> journal. I don't know how well it'll show up here with the green screen behind me. Up nope. of the uh, shoreline interurban is <laughs> <clears throat> the shoreline interurban historical society, which is, fabulous. Uh, it basically covers the rail railroads in and out of Chicago, mainly focused on the uh, interurban and commuter railroads. Uh, and uh, there's a la the, the last issue and this issue have uh, features about the interurban railroad uh, that was built for the Columbian Exposition to provide uh, transportation around the grounds. It was called the Interurban Railroad. It was about a three mile elevated line that was mm -hmm. built temporarily. And uh, that, and, I'm, and I quickly grabbed it to see where it would be, where the vessel would have been moored relative to a stop there. And it was, actually about 600 feet uh, based on my estimates from some photos from a uh, from the south terminal of that railroad and um, 
There's a photo in here showing it uh, birthed on the, uh, would be the east side of the South Pond, uh, literally nosed up to that uh, bridge that was built later, fe uh, fencing her in. Uh, and uh, this particular photo shows her, uh, shows about the port uh, forward quarter of the ship. Uh, there, it's quite interesting. And actually it was not that bad a position on the grounds based on the photos and maps uh, for a ticketed exhibit. You were basically at the end for people who wanted to try going back the other way. So uh, it, it was not that bad a position, but that was, but it's a very nice looking bridge that's holding her trapped into that uh, pond and uh, almost a shame to have to tear the bridge down to get her out. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, they they didn't tear the bridge. I mean, I think the I don't think the bridge survived the fires or or deterioration, uh, but they didn't get the progress out by taking down the bridge. They actually towed the progress across that spit of land that separated it from Lake Michigan, um, and and just you know yank, basically yanked it uh, across to to the other side. Um, <laughs> the, and actually, yeah, I think you can, yeah, you can see, okay. you can see how the rail it, it sort of goes off the picture here, but you can see how the rail loops, uh, right there, um, uh, you know, in front of, in front of it and behind it. No, uh, not, not so much according to, uh, to this photograph and, uh, that it, uh, you know, if I, uh, it appears the, the, the ship, the bridge, it appears, well, actually, that shows the, uh, the intramural, the pond coming around there, uh, uh, the other side of the ship. The, there, are, the the caption to the photo indicates that there were three ships sent by the Spanish government, three large sailing ships, mm -hmm. uh, to represent the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Right. Since after all, this was commemorating uh, Christopher Columbus and his voyage. Daniel. Daniel. Yeah. They, so. They, yeah, the, there actually were multiple ships. There was a Viking ship um, yeah. that, that came through, a replica Viking ship, the, the replicas of, of Columbus's ship. Um, and I forget where they all, they actually weren't far from, uh, from the progress. Um, I'm actually scanning the map to see if I can spot them um, on here. Um, From my understanding, they were in the Jackson Park Harbor. Not so much, not according to this photo. As a matter of fact, this photo that I'm looking at is in many ways different from uh, from your uh, your artist's rendering there. Uh, uh, there are just some things that don't really tie in uh, be, between the rendering and the photo. That that wouldn't be a big surprise. This that yes, I, lot. <laughs> I realize, Ted. <laughs> um, the other thing you can tell that there's a pier that that goes off off the the end of the map, and it's possible that there. More, more things were more that that went out further with with more things moored on there. Yes, well, that that pair is that wishbone that the uh, loop you see there is from a mo uh, moving sidewalk type affair that looped around to get people around uh, 
from the mainland out to the end of that pier. And that pier was mainly for the steamers from downtown and across the lake coming in. And then people would, uh, would, de uh, would debark there and uh, get on the, in walk around, get on the interurban railway to visit the rest of the fair. Um, so, uh, like I say, if you can uh, get a hold of the uh, Shoreline Interurban Historical Society, and they're uh, on, they have a website. Uh, I think that uh, this article will be posted there. Mm -hmm. It isn't there already. It's yeah, www.shore-line.com. O R G. Great. Thank you. I'll definitely look into it. All right. It was mentioned about the Viking ship. That does still exist. And tomorrow yeah. is their first day of the year that they're open for visitors. So that's out in Geneva, Illinois. So one weekend a month, they are open for visitors this year. Although they are uh, greatly limiting the number at each time to come in because of obvious reasons. Uh, there was a question yeah. written about uh, the mass. That noting that they're the tallest thing in that area and asked about how does one unmount and then remount or restep the mass? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I actually don't know the, the, the ins and outs of the engineering. What I can tell you is that all of it, the mass, the rigging, the, the, the ballast, it all had to be put on barges, flat, the flattest barges they could find um, that were then towed. So the progress is being towed and then the barges with everything on the progress is being towed behind it. And um, there's, a, there's a great, there was a great uh, children's book that was actually uh, commissioned by Henry Weaver to sell, you know, yet another thing to sell uh, on board along with the seashells. Uh, but within that, as a, one of the illustrations is actually of uh, the progress with all of its mass down and this barge uh, behind it. Um, in fact, uh, let me see. Ted, see if you can stop sharing your screen for just a second and let me see if I can find that real quick. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's just a great gives you a great sense of what uh, what this poor ship looked like by the time it was uh, stripped down. Just a second here. While you're looking, I'll just mention that once it did make it out of the canal system, I'm sure they went to a shipyard to have the mass re-stepped and re-rigged, so uh, so that didn't have to take place right there in the South Pond. Right. No. 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 It, they, once they once they got to Buffalo, um, you know, it goes to to appear and and. All right. So I'm just going to put this up real quick. Yeah, you can see you can see the the poor mass, you know, basically stripped down, and then how it's being so the progress is being towed. And then behind it is a barge with, with all of the stuff being towed as well. And you can see the, the passing through the St. Lawrence Canals uh, caption there. So this is from, from the uh, Illustrated Children's book that was sold, sold as part of the, the museum experience. Daniel? Mm -hmm. um, that town in Rhode Island with the library, could you spell that? for me? Westerly, W-E-S-T-E-R-L-E-Y-R-L-Y. Okay. That, it's basically my hometown. That's what I thought you said. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I, di I didn't realize that. So next time I'm there, I'll have to stop at the library. Yeah, please do. All right. Thanks very much. Sure. Along the same lines with that, there was a question posted asking if there is any chance that portions of the progress may still exist. As you said, the one piece was sent to Rhode Island. But... 
My my guess is no, because the fire, so it, it was a two parts that basically wiped it out. There was a, a finally caught fire middle of the night, um, February of 18 of 1902. Uh, and by all accounts, it was a pretty big fire. I mean, you know, it, it attracted a lot of spectators. Um, you know, as I said, this this whale ship had been soaked in in oil for for decades, so you know it seemed seemed to go up pretty darn well. And then, um, you know, what what remained was still imp impinging traffic, was still in the way of of you know traffic trying to move move in and out of the Calumet Harbor, um, and so that was dynamited. So by the time you take fire and dynamite and then whatever sinks to the bottom you know, a hundred years ago, you know, maybe there's something left, but, but my guess is probably not. Uh, Dan, from the way you described the situation, I intuited that the towing companies probably got together and burned the sucker. Yeah. I mean, the, so one of the, I mean, I won't call it a funny thing, but one of the more interesting things is both at the state street bridge and then, you know, there at, there in the in Lake Michigan, you know, you have this relic of the past basically impinging Chicago's modern maritime traffic. You know, uh, whether it's you know on the Chicago River or Lake Michigan, it's in the way. You know, it's this piece of history that nobody wants. Um, that's sort of blocking, gumming up the works and blocking things up. And so, you know, I suspect you're right. I suspect you know the 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 fire you know may not have been accidental um but there's a lot of speculation as to whether the the accident at the state street bridge was accidental or whether it was intentional uh because it was a, a pretty open secret that anybody that had to navigate around this whale ship uh the, around this tourist attraction whale ship was pretty ticked off um that it was there and so there was a lot of speculation that, you know, maybe this wasn't an accident that sent it to the bottom of uh, the Chicago River. Maybe it was intentional. Or if it wasn't intentional, certainly no tears were shed. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question was posted about when the progress is being towed. It appears that the bottom parts of the mass were still in place. Is that correct? And would it would have been possible to use gin poles to sway the other pieces of the mast up. Yeah, that I don't know. I mean, I didn't get into that level of detail um, in my research. Um, you know, the illustration was done uh, after the fact. Um, so, you know, the, the, the illustrator that Henry Weaver um, contracted for that actually wasn't there for the voyage. So it's possible that they were uh, completely removed as opposed to partially removed. But, you know, given that it was a children's book, you know, it may not have been, you know, an eye for, for uh, historical accuracy. Yeah, and that drawing, those were too short for the main mast, and they wouldn't have cut the main mast in half to leave that in place. <laughs> so I think there was some artist interpretation there. Yeah, I mean, he was a, he, he was a maritime illustrator. He actually did a lot of the uh, anytime the Chicago Tribune um, had uh, maritime illustrations uh, for their articles, they, they tended to get a uh, coffin, uh, GA coffin uh, for the job. And he's the one that actually does those illustrations. But again, he actually wasn't on, uh, on the voyage and, um, you know, probably a little artistic license was taken. Yes, oh. I would agree with that because for a children's book, you'd want to show something that shows it's a sailing ship. It could not have made it through the Welland Canal with those masts up. Yeah. Early on, there was a compliment made for you here. It says, uh, let me find it. If that open reading was an overture to whet my appetite to buy this book, it worked. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Hopefully you will see a spike in sales after tonight. Uh, well, I pre appreciate that. I really enjoyed that. Um, I will say, you know, I've, I've, I've given you lots of spoilers, uh, uh, but, you know, I think there's so many layers to the story. Um, and, and I do think, you know, even though we've talked a lot about, you know, 
some of the things that happened. There's so many other things that happen. You know, this this is a strange story. It just has so many twists and turns. Um, and even, you know, as I said, you know, we actually don't even start the voyage until about halfway through the book. Many of the things that happen leading up to this that sort of inform the 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 trip to Chicago and the time in Chicago, you know, that's full of all these these weird coincidences and stories and and bits and pieces. So, you know, I I encourage everyone that has you know interest, um, and if you don't want to buy it, that's okay. Uh, ask your local library to maybe uh, uh, provide a copy. But um, yeah, if you just have sort of a, a if I've as you say, whetted your appetite. Um, yeah, there's still a lot more uh, strange twists and turns to this this tale that we haven't uh, gotten a chance to get into tonight. I'll certainly back up that comment for Daniel. It, uh, it is definitely worth reading. There is much more to it and guarantee that you'll enjoy reading it. Thank you. Is the book available through Amazon? It is. It's on Amazon. Um, as well as uh, you know, other online, you know, Barn I think Walmart, and Barnes and Noble, and and the rest. So, good. Also, Ted, I just saw your gesture, and I did come to my senses and remember mastering the inland seas is your most recent book. It's excellent, <laughs> uh, especially talking about whale oil being used throughout the Great Lakes in the lighthouse. It's full of just great stories of maritime history in the Great Lakes. So be sure to check that one out as well. Thank you. <laughs> I had one other question, which is kind of remote from this thing, but you were talking about bailing and bending bailing. How do you bend bailing? <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually a naturally flexible material. So they would they would harvest it um, and dry it. Um, and, you know, that's not necessarily an easy thing to do in some of these climates, <laughs> but uh, once it was dry, it was actually naturally malleable. And so uh, then you could basically steam, re steam it, steam it at that point and then bend it into, into various shapes. And so, uh, as I said, baleen gets used um, shoehorns, um, you know, eyegla eyeglass frames, uh, buggy whips. Uh, but then, you know, the most, and even before corsets became popular, sort of. The generation earlier, the Andy Bellum generation, uh, the giant hoop skirts. Think of Scarlett O'Hara. Uh, a lot of times, those hoops uh, were were uh, circles of baleen. Interesting. Well, steaming is how you do it. Okay, mm -hmm. that was the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Dan, you before this, you wrote a book on uh, the history of picture postcards. And uh, one of my favorite websites before we have a guest speaker is Rate Your Professors. And so I, of course, often read about Ted Karamansky on there and you as well. And people loved your course on the history of American holidays when you were teaching at George Mason. Mm -hmm. They said wonderful things about you in that class. Yeah, I, I that was actually the very first class I taught and it was uh, uh, American history through its holidays, and uh, always, always want to come come back to that next next time I get an opportunity. It's a it's a lot of fun to to look at American history that way. Well, your students from those days would certainly support you uh, recreating <laughs> that class for new students. <laughs> Thank you. Any uh, any new works in the progress? Uh, I think I need to take a break. Um, I actually um, am taking a break from research and writing, but I am. Um, serving as a guest curator for uh, one of the museums here in uh, Louisville um, and looking at um, something completely different, uh, the Tudor Revival uh, movement um, in both Louisville and uh, the nation. Of course, Chicago has some fantastic Tudor Revival uh, homes and buildings, so uh, that's what I'll be working on for the next couple of years. All right, I'm reading the latest question. Uh, Jonathan Ronk asks about contacting Ted. He's been searching for a picture of the schooner Northerner. Um, Jonathan, I'm sure I could help you with a uh, photograph of that as well. If you want to shoot me an email at jimjarecki at aol.com, um, I can pass your question along to Ted as well then. 
I think if you got if you can get a picture, you'll be getting the fast. He'll get the picture faster than from me. Okay, his ancestors owned the ship. It's now in the National Register of Historic Places, thanks to Tammy Thompson up in at the Wisconsin Historical Society. It's it's a phenomenal shipwreck. It's certainly one of the favorite shipwrecks around the Great Lakes. One of the most photogenic for sure. But uh, like I said, drop me an email and I'll, uh, it, if a photo of it exists, I'll uh, get you a copy of it. If I may, I would like to put a plug in for the Mystic Seaport Museum. If you've never been there, you got to go there. It is the premier, you know, sailing museum. <laughs> No, definitely. And, and as, as we said, it's the, the only place you can see uh, one of these whale ships. Uh, there's only one of the, the you know, traditional wooden whale ships survives, and it's the, the Charles W. Morgan um, there at Mystic. Uh, the, uh, the other museum plug, we talked about the Bedford Whaling Museum. Um, one other museum that sort of feeds into this story um, and again, I'm giving, giving a little bit away here, but I mentioned Chicago, the, the Field Museum, and got all of these materials. And the very first year that the Field Museum was open, they displayed the whaling stuff. They, um, you know, something that the progress itself wasn't great at doing. Um, and pretty quickly, the, the, the natural, the zoology, botany, conchology, uh, anthropology departments, they pretty much all gang up and and say, you know, we hate this, get this whaling stuff out of here. <laughs> um, and so uh, they keep all of the natural stuff. They keep the seashells, they keep the bones, they keep the, the jaws and the corals and the bird feathers and, and the anthropology stuff. Uh, but anything whaling related actually ends up in what's now the Peabody Essex Museum um, in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, they uh, put, it, put it on express train. They could not get it out of Chicago fast enough for it to ship it back to, to Massachusetts. So, uh, so it, it, it didn't make it all the way back to New Bedford, but it does make it the, some of the whaling artifacts to make it full circle uh, back to the Peabody Essex. All right, well, it's... After 8.30 here, is the same time there, I think, in Louisville? We're an hour, we're in Eastern time, so. All right. Well, if, unless somebody else wants to jump in, I certainly want to thank you for taking the time. We really enjoyed it. I want to remind everybody that we really rely on your memberships. If you're not a member, any small donation, five bucks donation would be greatly appreciated, but uh, certainly appreciate memberships as well. That's all available. Uh, it was posted in the... Uh, chat. There's links yeah. for that. If, if you weren't here when that was posted, I don't think you can go back to it, but just go to Ch Chicago Maritime Museum.org and you can certainly find a place for uh, memberships there. Um, so I'll jump in. I'll jump in, Jim, and, and right. say it my way, uh, Thank you. just mm -hmm. to support what you just said. Um, these these Third Friday talks are free to members, and we really appreciate members who support us. We do ask non-members to give us a $5 donation. Not that it does to anything economically as much as we just want to see uh, a little bit of skin in the game and that you support us. We really do appreciate your love. Thank you. All right. Jim. Thanks, Jim. Yes. When are we going to open for real? <laughs> uh, we're shooting for June. Uh, that may be a little ambitious. Uh, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll pick that one up as well. Uh, as far as opening, we probably could open in the next uh, few weeks. Uh, a lot of the work needed to uh, reopen has been done. Um, one of the bottlenecks right now is COVID and having groups gathering, you know, uh, and manage through the museum. Um, my personal target is June. Um, early June. So that's what we're shooting for. Um, and we just have to wait and see what happens uh, uh, with the city of Chicago and whether there's an uptick or not. Uh, we've been burnt before. Um, everybody is just watching the 
we're watching the stats. Good, because I'm going to invite a whole bunch of people I know on the internet to come and see us. Right. Well, well, you'll be happy to know that that uh, the kitchen is all back together again. So we, we're from that standpoint, we're ready. Okay. Well, that's great. Uh, last chance for any comments. Otherwise, we'll thank both Ted Karamansky and Daniel Gifford for joining us tonight. Uh, sure appreciate your efforts. Thoroughly enjoyed the program. And uh, hope, Dana, anytime you're in Chicago, please come visit us. And any of you that are viewing from out of town, if you haven't been to the museum before, if you're in Chicago, please stop by and visit us. Check Will do. Out. Thank you so much for inviting me. All right, a lot of uh, people writing thank you that they enjoyed the show. Yeah, you, you can go back in the chat. Just scroll up. Yep. Well, if you joined after something was posted in the chat, you can't scroll up to that. You'll only see starting. I from can. I can. Yeah. There's a scroll okay. bar on the side. Yeah. Or you can hit the three dots and, and, and save the whole chat. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Very good. All right. Well, thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> thank, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. <laughs> and okay. uh, like I said, next month we're going to have uh, another talk on the history of the U.S. Life Saving Service on the Great Lakes by Fred Stonehouse. So please join us for that. And uh, if you have any uh, specific topics that you'd love to see us have, let me know. Uh, send an email to the museum. Otherwise, we'll keep choosing what I want to see. And it's been working pretty well so far. All okay. right. Thank uh, you. I'm going to, I'm going to stop the recording.